please take your Bibles and turn to chapter 8 in the book of Ecclesiastes. We're reading the first nine verses of that chapter. Ecclesiastes 8, verses 1 through 9. We read these words starting in Ecclesiastes 8.1. Who is like the wise, and who knows the interpretation of a thing? A man's wisdom makes his face shine, and the hardness of his face is changed. I say, keep the king's command because of God's oath to him. Be not hasty to go from his presence. Do not take your stand in an evil cause, for he does whatever he pleases. For the word of the king is supreme, and who may say to him, what are you doing? Whoever keeps a command will know no evil thing, and the wise heart will know the proper time and the just way. For there is a time and a way for everything. A low man's trouble lies heavy on him. He does not know what is to be, but who can tell him how it will be? No man has power to retain the spirit, or power over the day of death. There is no discharge from war, nor will wickedness deliver those who are given to it. All this I observe while applying my heart to all that is done under the sun, when man had power over man to his hurt. We all know people who lack wisdom and do unwise or what we would call dumb things. How many of you have done a dumb thing? Come on, raise your hands up. Okay. <laughs> you can raise two hands too. I, I can like it. Let me give you a couple instances. This will help the children in the audience today about dumb things. Don't think, oh, Pastor Shaw's never done a dumb thing. He's a minister. He doesn't do dumb things. Well, I've not always been a minister, so they can't say that about me. <laughs> Besides, I'm a kid. I was a kid just like a lot of kids. And kids do foolish things. Remember what Scripture says. Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. Well, I was foolish at times. One game that I played, well, first of all, I got a jackknife. I don't know why my dad thought I was old enough. I probably was not a cat. But I was still too young for a jackknife. I'll tell you why. In my neighborhood, and I knew just about every boy on either side of the street in our neighborhood, one day we had a vacant lot, two houses over from me, and we decided a number of us, it must have been about a dozen of us, maybe more, that we all had jackknives and we were going to play the game of stretch. Don't know if you've ever played that game. But in the game of stretch, what you do is you throw down your knife and then you stretch to pick it up. I don't know why that's such a big deal. But that's what uh, we were doing. And the thing was that all the guys were just throwing their knives. No one was saying, one, two, three, throw. No one was saying, I'm going, wait, for, wait, don't throw your knife while I'm throwing. No, all 12 or more of us threw our knives all the time. And so one of these times, I threw my knife. As I threw it down, I heard over my head. And someone said, look out, Rick! Thankfully, I didn't go and raise up. I stayed down. Because I would have been hit in the neck or in the back with that knife. Was that a dumb thing? Thank you, Martin. <laughs> I know one person concurs and you were I'll be a little older than I was. 
Huh, did I learn my lesson? No. A couple months later, I was cleaning my fingernails with my jackknife, and it slipped. And I cut myself a little sort of a square, or a corner of a square, on my left thumb. If you want to see my scar, it's still there, 60-some uh, years later. Another dumb thing. Now, not only are young boys dumb, so are adults. A man gets pulled over from the, by the police because he's been going a little over the speed limit. He argues with the policeman. Argument gets so heated, he ends up in a cell having disobeyed the police officer. Why? Because he done a dumb thing. He, he, he didn't submit to authority. Or uh, a lady traveler gets angry at the customs agent at the border and gives him a hard time because he's going to search through every piece of her luggage. Before you know it, he's threatening her and saying, do you want to enter this country or not? Or a pickup driver stopped, um, excuse me, a baseball coach. A baseball coach, we've seen it all the time. Call, a, a runner's called out, or batter's called out on strikes and all, and the coach jumps up, he runs out into the, on the field, starts arguing with the umpire, kicks dirt on him, maybe he gets a little too close, and bumps him. the next thing you know, you're out of here. Probably a foolish thing, especially if the game is close. An employee at his job loses his cool, he swears at his boss, he ends up being fired. Not a good thing to do. So yes, kids, kids don't just do dumb things. Adults do dumb things as well. People lack wisdom. And so, as we get to this place in Ecclesiastes, uh, the uh, preacher king, Solomon, is going to tell us, don't do dumb things. Be smart. You need practical wisdom in this world, and you need godly wisdom. So he's going to give us three points about wisdom today in our sermon. That wisdom is most valuable for living, and we certainly need to ask for it and grab onto it. In our text, the preacher is going to give us a positive point first, a practical point second. And a problem, see, so you got three keys, by the way. Three keys about wisdom. First, the positive about wisdom. It makes for a better person. One of the reasons your parents might say, get smart, be wise, is they don't want a dumb child to grow up into a dumb adult. A lot of smart child and the smart adult. That's what the preacher's talking about here. Who is like the wise man? Who knows the explanation of things? Or in the ESV, who knows the interpretation of a thing? There are those who take preacher Solomon's words as inviting a negative answer. There's not one person who's wise, no one. But I think we must take this, uh, these words differently. They're not being told that no one is wise, but that wisdom is rare, and that no one can compare, no one can compare with a person who is truly wise. Remember Solomon wrote in the previous chapter that it was well by impossible to find an upright man among a thousand. To find someone who knows how to explain the meaning of something or to interpret even an obscure and difficult passage of the Bible. Even ministers don't know sometimes. Have, uh, have you ever heard a minister say, you know, I can't tell you exactly what this text means. I can't tell you how it works out at all. People have studied this for centuries. They still don't know the answer. Why this text says what it says. That happens, maybe more rarely than usual. But it does happen, I have to just say, or a pastor, or whoever has 
is saying. We don't know exactly what Jesus was saying here, what Peter was saying here, what Moses was saying here. But God does give wise uh, matters to people. We think of uh, Joseph in the Bible, how God gave him divine wisdom. So much so that the Pharaoh said that he was, there was no one like him in his uh, nation. But we know that Daniel in Babylon uh, was a wise man. We know that he interpreted the dreams of Nebuchadnezzar. And God had given him wisdom. But we can't say, oh, that wisdom was for all of us. Uh, we know that Joseph was wise by God's grace. We know that Daniel was wise by God's grace. But who knows the meaning of things that are not in Scripture? Things that God does that we've been looking at for the last few weeks and know that there's sometimes just no answer. It's very frustrating as a pastor to have a family go through a problem and all you can say is, I can pray for you, I can pray for you. I don't know the answer. God hasn't revealed it. I can't go to Scripture and say why you lost your child, or why you lost your house, or why such and such occurred in your life. Yet we know those things happen. And we'll see as we get into this chapter more how God gives some revelation to us, how we can live in the light of this matter. Not only does the Bible give enlightenment to those that are privileged to receive it, and perhaps that's why I don't know that Joseph ever prayed for wisdom, but I'm sure he prayed for answers to his life. So why his brothers hated him and sold him into slavery? Why he ran into the problems with Potiphar's wife? And why he languished for so long in prison in Egypt? And uh, I don't know that if Daniel even asked the Lord for wisdom, specifically, though know, God gave it to him. It's a, a providential, uh, divine uh, right of God alone to give gifts to men. And so he will. But not only does biblical wisdom give enlightenment to those that are privileged to receive it, Solomon says it brightens the face of those who receive wisdom. Notice there in verse 1. A man's wisdom makes his face shine, and the hardness of his face is changed. I don't know if any of us, I can't give, give any instance where I've noticed a wise person and thought, why they glow? <laughs> Why? When, I, when they walk into a room, everything brightens up. But this is sort of something of what uh, Solomon is saying here. Now, Philip Ryken, in his commentary on the book of Ecclesiastes, gave the closest uh, analogy to anything I could find. He writes that in a 2008, in 2008, a prominent atheist named Matthew Harris spelled with two R's, wrote an essay entitled, Why Africa Needs God. An atheist writing, Why Africa Needs God. In this essay, he admitted that Christianity, Christianity made a tangible difference in the lives of people whom he knew while he was growing up in his boyhood home in Malawi and other areas of Africa. He spoke of the admiration he had for the work that Christians were doing to care for people and the sick. And then he said this about their looks. The Christians were different. Their faith appeared to have liberated and relaxed them. There was a liveliness, a curiosity, an engagement with the world. Whenever we entered a territory worked by missionaries, we had to acknowledge that something changed in the faces of the people we passed and spoke to. Something in their eyes. You know, we often talk about the world's watching us. But here's a, an atheist who uh, acknowledged and saw something in believers. As a child, as a young man, whatever it was. 
that's interesting. Biblical wisdom does bring personal transformation. Maybe you know somebody who uh, you feel is, is very wise and you feel confident or, or calm about them because you think, I've got somebody who knows what to do in whatever and every situation. So you relax a little bit. Like, oh, something happens and they're in my presence. I'm pretty well off. I've got somebody who's wiser than me. And that's, that's not a bad thing, especially if you're a godly person. Wise believers should have an inner joy that radiates to people. Is God making your face shine? Where is the wisdom in your life? Well, that's point one. Point two is the practicality to wisdom. As Solomon says, it makes for a better citizen. He especially illustrates this with how a person with wisdom acts around those with authority over them. It encourages us to obey those in authority over us. That's what I read from Romans 13, where Paul writes, Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. A wise person will know that God establishes kingdoms and gives position to those in authority. So the wise and godly way to live under authority is to do a solemn and advise us. He writes uh, in our uh, text, I say, keep the king's command because of God's oath to him. Preacher lists three reasons to live in obedience to those orders. The first is because you, uh, you of this oath that he talks about. Literally, the Hebrew reads, because of the oath of God. And there are two ways of taking that phrase. It could mean a loyalty oath as a new king takes uh, a new position as king of royalty in the nation. God expects, or he, uh, I'll say the king, first of all, expects that everybody is going to bow down to him when he walks around and see him as the king and not try to overthrow him the first month that he's around. That's one way of looking at this. But I think it's better to take it this way the phrase is that the oath of God refers to a divine promise. A promise that God makes when He installs a king upon a throne. The rightful kings of Israel were recipients of divine promises, like David, like Solomon. So God swore to King David that one of his sons would sit on Israel's throne forever. There's a divine promise. And that's the covenant God made with David. That's why I read from Psalm 110. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. People are obliged to obey their earthly king because God puts kings in office. Does God put presidents in office? Yes. Does God put senators in office? Yes. Does God put mayors and governors in office? Yes. And so we need to honor God when we honor those in office. We must have a high view of God's providence in politics. Calvin wrote that events in our world are directed by what he called the secret stirring of God's hand. He also wrote, ignorance of providence is the ultimate of all miseries. The highest blessedness lies in the knowledge of it. Why is it that people have reverses or crooks of the law, as we talked about a few weeks ago, in their lives, and they feel like, I can't take this. I don't like this. And good Christian people will say that. They'll say, Lord, enough is enough, or whatever the situation. We have to understand that God has his, his laws, His rules for all of His purposes in our lives. So Solomon's giving us practical wisdom. And he even gives it here when we're under an earthly authority. 
that isn't righteous, and we might not be certain what we should do. Uh, we have a couple of examples here in verses 3 and 4. He says in verse 3, Be not hasty to go from his presence, that's the king. Do not take your stand in an evil cause, for he does whatever he pleases. For the word of the king is supreme, and who may say to him, What are you doing? This reminds me of Esther. I wrote a, wrote a whole series on Esther, so I may have one preaching. No way. I have a bunch of sermons right now that are sitting, vegetating, I guess you could say in the filing cabinet. But I can remember about Esther when she was asked by Mordecai to go and approach the king on behalf of the Jews. What did she write back to her uh, cousin? If I perish, I perish. In other words, she couldn't be certain, could she? She didn't know how King Ahasuerus, I prefer to call him Xerxes, it's a little easier to pronounce, uh, how Xerxes uh, when we had. In Persian culture, entering the king's presence without a summons can get you killed. To leave the king's presence when you weren't given permission to leave can get you killed. So that's why Esther was very concerned. But she hadn't been bitten by King Xerxes. Even though she was the queen, he hadn't called for her to come into his presence. So for her to go and try to get a hearing with him, was a threatening thing. Now the preacher is not saying we never have a duty to disobey the government in order to fulfill our higher obligation to God. He's simply telling us not to be hasty, to walk away from any authority and try to uh, impose ourselves on any authority when we're not expected to be there. He warns against uh, taking our stand for something that's wrong, he says. We're not to fight evil with ungodliness, but with godliness. To try to argue an authority which is supreme is not wise. Since the king's word is supreme, who can say to him, what are you doing? So the words. When you disagree with authority, always remember, they have more authority. So if you're going to go to somebody, even the kids, even your teacher, even your parents, even you know, the mayor of the city, you're going to go to the city council and argue something. Remember, they have authority, especially in whatever place you are, more than you do. So be wise. So I am tempted and have been, maybe you have to, to write to officials. I have a senator in this state who I've written to a few times over the years he's been in office and he almost always responds, and he always responds the wrong way as far as I'm concerned. In other words, he's justifying why he would vote the way he votes. My tendency is to send him another letter and say, you fool, Wait, don't you know that we're God? You know, that abortion is sinful? Or, or that you know, the border should be secure? Or whatever it might be. But you know, when I think about it, you can write letters to your blue in the face and not this some evil person in office. So the best thing to do is pray to the Lord for him to change things. That's one thing we can do as Christians. We have a sovereign God. So let's pray to him. You may have to spend hours doing that. But let's pray to him. If nothing else, God can change our hearts and say, Lord, you're sovereign and you want him in office and have to wait. You know his best. But ask God to change the heart of the king or remove the king. Don't try to change things yourself. The 
second reason is given by the preacher about the practicality of wisdom. Whoever obeys his command will come to no harm. Generally speaking, it's a wise thing to keep the laws of the land. If you're unwise or not the wrong person, then you go where you have from your care. It's wisdom to know when to speak and when to listen. It is not sinful to shut your mouth when you don't know what to say. And you don't and you're afraid of saying the wrong thing. It's wisdom. Perhaps just to say more about what I was saying. If you don't want me to speak, the more you you have to do it. We have to be that. Submitting to the rule of law is a valid principle for living. It's a strong possibility here that Solomon views an all-powerful ruler in mind, someone different than the president of the United States, where we have a republic and we have branches of government. Where in, you know, in some lands, the king's law is if you go against the king, off with your head, all the way into the prison, you go. And you have no say. So that's what Saul is probably doing here. He's trying to tell us, you know, when you have someone who's the supreme authority, you learn wisdom, you know how to act. Finally, this practical uh, application that Saul is giving to us. He speaks about God's rule. And the wise in part will know the proper time and procedure for every man. Here's the rule to follow as we live in a fallen and unjust and dangerous world. It's the kind of rule the preachers constantly remind us about. The wise person will have a sense of God's time. Right? But I, I can't say that I know what they I know Rick's time, it's usually 99 or 9 percent wrong of all the time. A wise person has a view of God's time. Maybe it's because a person who's truly wise probably knows God's word better than the rest of us. And therefore, he submits to God's word. He learns, you know, that, that it's best to pray and not to say it. Remember in Ecclesiastes 3, we learned there's a time for everything, a season for every activity under heaven. I'll well, paraphrase what Solomon writes here in verse 5. A wise mind will know the right time and the right way for every necessity. To, pair, uh, to uh, think about it, uh, Solomon's probably saying something like in the book of James, where James says, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask of God. Gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given all. In some way, James' words, I think, are a compliment to Ecclesiastes 8.5. Who always knows just the right thing to do at just the right time? I know I know, and I expect most of us know what to do. So, how important then is this injunction in conjunction with James 1.5? We're going to know the exact procedure when the proper time arrives. We're going to have to have a wisdom that only God can provide. I think um, of a prayer that came to my mind as I was preparing this sermon. It's a, pro a priority for our, our daily lives, for our prayers. But I have been uh, guilty of not praying this because I hate saying my daily prayers. And I, I uh, urge you to think this way. We need, we need to pray just a simple petition as we begin our prayers or in our prayers. Lord, I need wisdom for this minute. That the proper, at the proper time, I will carry out what exactly you want me to do with what is best in this situation. Lord, hear my prayer and provide exactly what I need. Simple, humble petitions. But we, we neglect that. And then we wonder why we fail here today. Why so many events go down in our lives. Perhaps not all of them are because of our stupidity or our, our laziness spiritually or whatever. But 
some of them are. Some of them could be, some of the problems are why it's going to be remedy if you just learn to ask God for wisdom and pray before you do. Finally, we come to the third uh, point here. The problem with wisdom, it doesn't make one all wise. We sort of heard that from the last sermon, but here Solomon repeats it, I think. Godly wisdom is strong and vital for our lives, but here's the hardest part of this text, I think, that we come to. Because he tells us, no man has power over the wind to contain it. Uh, and then he goes on to list three other things. But in other words, he's saying here, we can't expect that because God gives us wisdom that we're going to be all wise like God. We aren't going to be omniscient. We can't expect that. We'll always be men and women. We'll never be God. Yes, we can have some of his divine character. Wisdom is part of it. No, we can't expect that we can get everything our way all the time no matter what. As I prepared this message, I saw the, these words, no man has power over the wind, uh, right in Montgomery County. Remember, uh, this summer, I think, was about two years old. Well, 2021. But as I wrote this sermon, we had a tornado hit in Montgomery County, and the uh, our regional home missionary, David Holm, had a tree fall in his house and do damage to his house. That was the day or at the time when he was writing this sermon. And so we don't have power over the wind. We certainly don't have power over strong winds. But let me add here, we don't have power over a gentle breeze either. We, we, we can't. You can't uh, say, tree, move your leaves a little bit. I'm, I'm sitting under you and I want some wind. We can't even do that. So Solomon's a right. He says, no one has power over the wind. Secondly, he says, no one has uh, power over the time of their death. You can't add one breath to your life when God's taking you. You can't sustain your life for five more minutes. And God says, it's all over. It's the end. God sets a time of death and appointment. And it's one even in our lives. Uh, it's one even in our lives we fail to miss. We have no control over our death. Thirdly, he says, uh, uh, to show the problem of wisdom, uh, there's no discharge from war. No one is discharged in time of war. Once a battle starts, you cannot leave the army. You are there. Oh, you might run from battle. You, you might fail to fight. But you're going AWOL. And you know what happens to those that go AWOL. Uh, it's not pleasant. So you can't request a furlough in the middle of a battle. And then fourthly, he says, there's no deliverance from wickedness for those who practice it. He says, so wickedness will not release those who practice it. This is his most important observation. Just as one can restrict, you can't restrain the wind, you can't stop your dying, you can't receive a discharge in time of battle, so we'll never be delivered by, uh, by our wickedness. Try as we might. There's no escaping the consequences of wickedness when you practice wickedness. Having just spoken of how uh, wickedness practiced by the wicked, the nation brings judgment upon them. The preacher adds in verse 9, All this I saw as I applied my mind to everything done under the sun. There's a time when man lords it over others to his own prayer. You know, uh, this gives me some hope in the America. People are doing wrong in this country. 
they will not win in the end. Oh yes, America may not, may not become the America we know. But God is on the throne, and no one is going to be able to withstand the judgment of God. And God says, it is over, and you have to stand before me and give an account. Well, Jesus Christ will make sure that the judgment is led justly. And no one's wickedness will prevail. So that's our uh, verse tells us in the end that all that we gain from wisdom and all that we don't gain from wisdom, God will take care of things in the end. And we're more than conquerors to him who love us. Now, having heard all the preacher king has said to us, what's the answer to all of this? What is godly wisdom? What is the godly way to live? It seems like everything's so negative, doesn't it? Don't you sometimes throw up your hands and say, why are things getting worse and worse? Of course, God has something to say about that. But at the same time, I know I don't want to see it in my lifetime. Let it, let it be for my great grandchildren or something. <laughs> let, let it go down the road. Uh, not now. I want freedom. That's not necessarily the way God's going to work. So what is the wise way in life to act on things when we need really wisdom? Well, the wise way of life is to submit to the sovereignty of God and to trust your life completely to His care through faith in Jesus and devote yourself to serving Him, doing what He calls you to do. Let God take care of that's what the preacher is saying. Jesus Christ is the wisdom of God. If we want to know the wise way to live, we look to Him and to the Scriptures for guidance and wisdom. Jesus Christ is the King of all kings. So when we submit to the earthly rulers of the land, we're really honoring Christ's eternal kingship. Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. He's the one whom the Father sent live a perfect life and die fully a twenty death for our sins. We are never losers when we come to Him by faith for the forgiveness of our sins to live for Him and trust Him for our future. Find me Jesus Christ the eternal Lord of glory. He alone can deliver us from death and give us abundant joy in God's presence forever. When we believe in Jesus, we not only the assurance our sins are forgiven and we have peace with God, but life in all its fullness, and eternal bliss, and the new heavens and the new earth will be ours. We have so much to live for, but not for this life, for eternity. So give yourself to Christ, and you'll be secure despite all the troubles and uncertainties of life. As he faced death during the reign of Nazism in Germany, Helmut von Moltke quoted a line from a favorite hymn. He for death is ready, who living claims to be. He for death is ready, who living claims to be. I don't know that now. But what about his words are from? But are you ready for death? Claim to Jesus. Claim to your God. We will have godly wisdom and we too cling by faith to Jesus Christ and rely on Him completely so that we are ready for death and everything else. 